Yeah, we, we now get into this uh, new uh, topic of um, reasoning with uncertainty. I mean, we did the introduction last week and uh, I mean, more or less to make it short, what we have seen is that um, currently, let's say the last 10 years, uh, probab probability theory and extensions are what, uh, what is the, the major uh, approach to reasoning with uncertainty. And that's what we, I mean, we introdu introduced probabilities, um, the, the probabilistic calculus, um, and now we will start with yeah, what I would call the best approach, the optimal approach, with, which is maximum entropy. So, um, yes, yeah, the maximum entropy method. That's what I will introduce today. Huh? Um, it is a calculus for reasoning with uncertainty. Um, and with incompleteness. So if there, if there is missing knowledge, um, then we can still solve our equations, what you will see in a few minutes. Huh? Um, and uh, I mean this, this whole thing is based on a theory developed by the physicist uh, chains in the 1950s. So this is quite some time ago when he developed uh, this uh, method. Um, yeah. We will introduce this method with a simple, uh, small example and uh, then we will look at some other examples. You will do this in the exercises too and then we will show you the application uh, in the LexMate project. LexMate is what we already talked about, this medical application for appendicitis diagnosis. There you will see a successful project using maximum entropy. Okay, yeah, so maybe we, sh we, we start uh, developing this on the blackboard. Um, yeah, let's Let's talk for a few minutes about logic. Yeah? How we do reasoning with logic. Um, who knows the, the inference rule called modus ponens? Modus ponens is the best known logical inference rule. Even people who don't have to do anything with logic or with AI may know it. Who has heard about modus ponens already? Okay, some of you, fine. Um, maybe because you, uh, you uh, attended uh, theoretical informatics last semester, maybe for other reasons. Let's, let's look at modus ponens. Modus, modus ponens is an inference rule that we can apply if we have some knowledge. We know a proposition A and we know that if A is true, then B is true, what can, what can we then derive? If we have this knowledge, we know A and we know A implies B. What, we, what can we infer now from this? That B is true. Yeah. So we can now conclude B. And in logic, I mean, this is, this is now an inference rule. This rule tells us if I know A and I know A implies B, then I know B. Yeah? And inference rules are typically written in this way. So we write the assumptions we need to know and then below this line we write the conclusion. Yeah? Okay. Um, so this is a, uh, the simplest uh, or well-known inference rule in logic. Okay, and we already used this rule when we talked about the Tweety example and we have seen that there are problems with the Tweety example 
by using just this inference rule. What we now do is we want to extend this inference rule to probabilistic knowledge, to uncertain and incomplete knowledge. Yeah? <laughs> so now we already introduced the probabilistic calculus. We know about conditional probabilities. So now let's write the same thing with conditional probabilities. So we know, we don't, maybe we don't know that A is true, but we have some uncertain information. Maybe we know the probability for A is 0.9, something like that. Huh? So suppose we know P of A is equal to 0.9. Huh? And uh, maybe we know something about this rule. Uh, maybe we know P of A. Uh, no, now we, we, we make two steps. P of B given A is equal to 0.75, for example. Huh? I mean, this P gi a B given A corresponds to A implies B. I mean, this is something like if A is true, then B is true. And this is something like, um, if A is true, then the probability for B is 0.75. So this also is a probabilistic extension of what we had here, uh, at least roughly speaking. Exactly, it's not, it's not perfectly true. Uh, but this is a probabilistic formulation for such if-then rules. Uh, if I know A, then B is true with a probability of 75%. Okay. So, this is just a generalization of what we would need in logic. This is much more general because... Why is it much more general? because we now can deal with uncertainty. Huh? We really can deal with uncertainty. Okay, but we have to, of course, we have to complete our inference rule. So now, let's, let's state it as a question. We want to know P of B. That's what we want to know. Huh? Um, so P of B is equal to and let's put a question mark here. That would be nice if we would have a calculus that given this knowledge and given this knowledge we can compute P of B. And the question is how does this formula look like to compute B of B? And that's what we want to look at now. Well, let's just start and try to calculate P of B with classical means from probabilistic calculus. P of B, and we have learned about this rule called marginalization last week. Yeah? I mean, we are talking about these two variables A and B. So our probabilistic space is two-dimensional. Now, <coughs> what does marginalization mean? Who can, who can give me the formula? How can we compute P of B out of this um, joint distribution for A and B? How do we get P of B out of our joint distribution for A and B? How 
I really want to encourage you to uh, keep track with the exercises. Huh? P A M B plus P not A M B. Yes, that's true. So P of A comma B plus P of not A comma B. Yeah. Okay. So in order to calculate P of B, we need to know these two guys here. Now, if we look here, we don't know either of them. But how can we manipulate these two terms in order to get closer to what we have there? You know how to get from this to this and the other way around. How does that work? I mean, we just use the definition of conditional probability or if we use it the other way around, this is what we call the product rule. So we can write it down like P of uh, B given A times P of A that's for this, plus P of B given not A times P of not A. Okay, so now, yeah, now let's compare this with this. And let's mark in yellow what we know already. We know P of B given A. We know this one. We also know P of A. What about these two guys? P of not A is 1 minus P of A. Yes, that's true. So P of not A would be 0.1. We know all these three. What about this here? P of B given not A. Is this 1 minus P of B given A? No, it's not. This is not true. What is true is, I mean we can write it maybe down here. Uh, P of not B given not A is equal to 1 minus P of B given not A. This is true. So if you take the negation of, uh, of this first argument, then you can write it as 1 minus. Huh? But not if you take the second argument. This is not true. So we cannot compute this P of B given not A from this one. Yeah. Um, but what we can do is, at least we can say P of B is greater than or equal to P of B given A times P of A. That's what we know in any case. Why can we derive this? Yeah, because we know this, and that's what we have here. And this product is greater than or equal to zero because probabilities are positive all the time. Um, so this product is greater than or equal to zero. And that's why we, I mean, at least we know something about P of B. Huh? P of B, I mean, this means here P of B is greater than or equal to uh, point 0.9 times point 0.75. What is that? Um, it's point 0.675. Is that true? Yeah. I 
I mean, at least we have some information about P of P. Huh? But what we do not know is, I mean, we know P of P, uh, I mean, we can now conclude P of P is um, is in the interval 0.675,1. Somewhere in between these two numbers. But at the moment we don't know more. It might be, it might be this value, it might be this value, it might be in the, in the middle between these two guys. We have no idea. And the question is whether whether this is all we can derive or whether we can get more information about P of B. And the answer is with, with classical probability calculus we can't get further. Why? The reason is quite simple. What do we need to know in order to answer any questions? We need to know the joint distribution. And how many entries has the joint distribution for two binary variables, A and B? How many entries? Four. Huh? All four combinations of A and B true and false. Huh? Only three of these are independent. Why? Why is one of the four redundant? One is true and one is false. Excuse me? One is true and one is false. Oh, I don't understand this. What, what, uh, what does that mean, one is true and one is false? Yes, but that, that gives us four combinations. Okay, but why do we need to know only three of them? Excuse me? Because? One minus the three? Is three yeah. Is the fourth. Is the fourth. Yeah, okay. So this is because of the normalization condition, because the sum of all probabilities has to be one all the time. Huh? Okay, so in this case we have full knowledge if we have three independent, um, let's say, equations or numbers. But what do we have here? We know P of A, we know P of B given A, this is two numbers, <coughs> And that's um, not enough. That's not enough. We would need at least three numbers and then we could compute everything. And that's the, the underlying reason why we cannot solve this equation P of B exactly. So if we would know some um, additional information, maybe if we would know P of B given not A, for example, yeah? then we could solve it. But here we have missing knowledge. Yeah? Here knowledge is missing. And now, yeah, how, uh, how can we, how can we uh, proceed? Now, what we do next is, we introduce some shorthand. So we, uh, we say P1 is equal to P of B, um, no, sorry, P of A and B. Or maybe we do this on the slides. I can just, uh, yeah. So we use this shorthand here. P1 is P of A, B. P, P2, A not B, P3, P not A, B, and P4, P of not A not B. Okay, so this, this P1 through P4 is just an abbreviation uh, such that we don't have to write so much all the time. Okay, 
Yeah. And you see um, our probability distribution P of A comma B now can be written as the vector P1, P2, P3 and P4. Yeah. And now let's write down the knowledge we have. Um, this equation P of A can be written as P1 plus P2 is equal to 0.9. Okay? Because P1 plus P2 is P of A. Huh? Now, um, how about this equation? P of B given A is 0.75. So, P of B given A is P of um, A comma B divided by P of A. Um, yeah. And this is 0.75. And now we can uh, bring this on the other side and we get P of A comma B is 0.75 times P of A. And this can be written as um, so what is our P of A comma B? This is P1 is equal to 0.75 times P of A and P of A is um, what is it? P1 plus P2. Yeah. So we can write as the next equation P1 is equal to 0.75 times P1 plus P2. So you see we have two equations for two unknowns. Finally, we want to know P1 through P4. These four guys, that's what we want to know. And we have a third equation, which is P1 plus P2 plus P3 plus P4 is equal to 1. This is the normalization condition. That's the equation we always have. Huh? So now we have three equations for four unknowns. And that's all we have. And you see, this is an underdetermined linear system. Four unknowns, only three equations. How can we solve such an underdetermined system? I mean, yeah, in the math lecture, towards the end of this semester, we will see methods for solving overdetermined and underdetermined linear systems. Huh? Um, I mean, with classical methods, we just have to stop here and look what we can compute and what we cannot compute. No? But yeah, let, let's, let's just try, try with classical methods. Okay, but before we continue, we introduce another uh, shorthand. Um, So I will now yeah, just keep it here and do it with color. I will, we will call this alpha and we will call this value beta. It may be any value between 0 and 1. This alpha 
and uh, this beta 2. So then we can write here this is equal to alpha and this is equal to beta. And actually, if you look at this equation, we can make it even simpler. Because we know P1 plus P2 is equal to alpha, so we can replace this by alpha. So P1 is alpha times beta, P1 plus P2 is alpha. So, I mean, we're um, this is a pretty nice situation because we have already solved uh, our system for P1. We know the value for P1, which is alpha times beta. And we also know P2. Uh, we can now derive P2 is equal to alpha minus P1, which is alpha minus alpha times beta, which is alpha times 1 minus beta. So you see, we, we already know the value for P1 and the value for P2. And we can, of course, substitute these values here. We actually have to substitute only this value. Uh, so we can replace P1 plus P2 here by alpha. And we can conclude P3 plus P4 is equal to uh, 1 minus alpha. And now let's put this into a box. Because, not because this is so nice, just because this is not nice. I mean, here we cannot continue. We just know that the sum of these two variables is 1 minus alpha. But we don't know the exact values. I mean, look at our example with the concrete numbers. So alpha is 0.9. So what we know here is P3 plus P4 in this example is equal to 0.1. So it may be P1, P3 is 0.1 and P4 is 0 or the other way around or something in the middle, both are 0 0.05. This is all possible. Yeah. And now, the, uh, Mr. Chains he said, okay, if we have no knowledge about, I mean, we know P1 and P2, that's finished. But we know nothing about this, the distribution of these two values, P3 and P4. What are P3 and P4? These are, so the not A case, and then B and not B. Yeah? So we don't know this distribution of B um, for the case not A. Huh? We don't know it at all. And now what Chains did is, he said, okay, if we have, if we have this lack of knowledge, then um, it is not allowed to put ad hoc knowledge into the system. Putting ad hoc knowledge into the system would, for example, be that, that we say, okay, we assume P4 is equal to zero. And then we can solve for P3. I mean, this is a solution of this underdetermined system. This is just one out of infinitely many solutions. But this is not allowed, because that would mean putting ad hoc knowledge into the system. That, that would mean I would put too much knowledge, maybe too much knowledge into the system. And that's not allowed. So what, what Chains said is, okay, we, um, 
we just state a new principle and this new principle is that means of course we have to put some knowledge into the system but as little knowledge as possible huh? we are not allowed to put too much knowledge into the system um, okay and now the question is of course how can we measure the knowledge in our system how can we measure the knowledge of a probability um, uh, distribution and with knowledge the, the more exact term is information how can we measure the amount of information that we have in our probability distribution that's the question yeah? and maybe we should look a little bit I will not give you a proof of what chains derived this is the entropy function but I want to give you some examples and give you an intuition about uh, what we are going to do now yeah we don't need this more We can draw the following picture. Um, in this world, our probability distribution, where did we have it? No, I just erased it, yes. I mean, it's this, this, uh, this guy here. This vector consisting of four numbers. The four numbers are P1, P2, P3, and P4. Okay. So now we can on this axis just draw these four values P1, P2, P3 and P4 huh? um, yeah. Let's see um, And now here we, we draw the values that these four variables have. And we know this normalization condition has to be true all the time. Okay. Now we could, for example, say, and, and let's say here we have one and here we have zero. Then one distribution may be this one. So P1 is equal to 1 and all the others are 0. This is one uh, such distribution. An extreme distribution. Because this distribution would tell us what? No, not equal to alpha. P1 is equal to 1. P1 is equal to 1, not to alpha. I mean, we, we are not talking at the moment about these alphas and betas. We are just talking about any distributions of these four variables. I mean, this tells me P1 is equal to 1, and this is P of A, comma B is equal to 1 and that tells us A is true and B is true for sure huh? I mean we could take another example we take 0.5 here for P1 and uh, for P3 0.5 this is again a distribution uh, where the normalization condition is fulfilled What would you say, take this first example, P1 is equal to 1 and compare it with this. Where do we have more uh, information about the state of our system? In the first case, because we are sure that uh, yeah. A and B is true. Yeah. 
yeah, in the first case, which is this one, we are sure A and B is true. Here, um, P of A and B is 0.5. So we don't have perfect information. Uh, and this is actually the point. If we have such an extreme distribution where one entry is one and all the others are zero, this is the, the distribution with the highest information content. Now, what is the other extreme? Which is the distribution with the lowest information? All P's are 0.5. All P's are 0.5. Then we have a uniform distribution. Oh, 0.25. Perfect. Yeah. 0.5 wouldn't be good. Why? Yeah, because the sum then would be 2. Okay, so we have to take this distribution. This is an, an allowed distribution. And why is the information content of this distribution minimal? It can't be smaller. Let's take an, uh, an even simpler example. Um, let's throw a coin. And some action depends on throwing the coin. Huh? Now, if we throw the coin and before, you should guess what is the probability for, uh, uh, for heads up or down? What would you guess? What is the probability for the head on top? You would guess 0.5, of course. Because you have no knowledge about this coin. Maybe this coin is not symmetric and maybe more often it comes, comes out this or that way. But since you have no knowledge, you would assume both, both outcomes of the uh, experiment have the same probability. And it's similar here. Our experiment may have these four outcomes, but if you know nothing about this world, then you would have to assume all probabilities are the same, which we call the uniform distribution. Okay, so we would, so we need a measure of information contents of distributions that fulfills, I mean, these two can conditions and even more. First, first uh, condition is that if we know nothing, then, um, which is minimal information, then the solution has to be the uniform distribution. Huh? If we know that one of our events comes out all the time, then we need to have this distribution with a one here and a zero on the other uh, events. Um, and this must have highest information. And anything else is somewhere in between. Okay. So we already have a, a calculus for reasoning with perfect uncertainty. So if we know nothing, the only correct answer is we assume all have the same probability. All, uh, all the events have the same probability. If we have perfect information so that we know one of the events comes out all the time, then we need a 1 for this and a 0 for the others. But what about such a case? This is somewhere in between. We have some knowledge about our distribution. Now what to do here? So if we draw this here, we would, I mean, what do we know? We know P1. Let's take this example. P1 is, well, what is P1? Is alpha times beta. This is point nine, so 0.675. 
So we have P1 is somewhere here, 0 0.675. P2 is 1 minus alpha, which is 0 0.1. Is that true? Yeah. It's here, 0 0.1. And now what about these two guys? That's the question. How should we, I mean, we, we of course we know P3 plus P4 is 1 minus alpha and alpha was 0.9. So we know that the sum of these two guys is 0.1. So is this true that P2, what was P2? Alpha times one minus beta. Oh yes, that's true. Okay, alpha times one minus beta. So, uh, so this maybe is not correct. One minus beta is 0.25 times alpha 0.9. So this is point. Uh, 2 to 5. So it's somewhere here. Yeah. Okay, but still we don't know about these two guys. We just know the sum of these two and that's it. Okay, and for such a general case um, one can prove that the entropy function is the right function to, that measures the degree of uncertainty. Yeah? Um, so it, it, this is just the opposite of information. The entropy was introduced as a function that measures the degree of uncertainty in a probability distribution. Okay. Um, so then if we take the negative entropy, this gives us a measure for the information contents. Okay, so and what, what do we want? We are looking for, here in this example, for a distribution with minimal information contents and since this is the negative of the uncertainty, we are looking for a distribution with maximum uncertainty, so we are looking for a distribution with maximum entropy. Huh? I do not give a proof, a derivation of that shows the entropy function is the correct function to measure the information contents. We will give um, a simple derivation later on when we talk about decision trees. Here we just accept and believe that um, um, the entropy is what we need. And the, the formula for the entropy, that's what we have here. So if we have such a probability vector, a probability distribution, and this vector P contains all the values, like here P3 and P4, then the entropy is minus the sum over the product PI uh, log PI. Huh? And this gives us a measure of the entropy, of the uh, uncertainty. Okay. And what we now do is we will maximize the entropy of our distribution. So now let's go, let's get back to our problem we had here. What, we, what do we have? The problem was we have four unknowns but only three equations. We have an underdetermined system. And that's what we do all the time in mathematics when we want to get one solution for an underdetermined system. Underdetermined systems uh, typically have infinitely many solutions. They may have no solution too if there is a contradiction, but typically they have infinitely many solutions. Now if we want to pick one out of these infinitely many solutions, what we do then is we introduce a principle. Here we introduce the principle of maximum entropy. So we take a different view. 
here at this point you really have to take a different view. Just forget this view of uh, four unknowns and three equations. Forget the knowledge we have. Suppose we have no knowledge of our distribution. What, do, what will we do? We will maximize the entropy. We will just maximize the entropy. Huh? And it will, be, uh, it will be an exercise for you to maximize the entropy with no knowledge. That means just maximize this function. So in our example, you could, for example, maximize um, the function which is minus um, P1 ln P1 plus P2 ln P2 plus P3 ln P3 plus P4 ln P4. P1. So we are looking for a maximum of this function in the four-dimensional space. P1, P2, P3, and P4. So now think about um, the deep knowledge, hopefully, hopefully not so deep down in your brain, about uh, maximizing functions of many variables. What will you do? You have to find, this is a function of four variables, P1 through P4. How, will, how would you maximize this? How would you find a maximum or all maxima of this function? How does that work? You have to compute all partial derivatives with respect to all variables. This gives you how many equations? It gives you four equations. You take the partial derivative with respect to P1, uh, P2, P3 and P4 and set all these partial derivatives equal to zero. Huh? And then you, you, and now you see, this is nice because you get four equations. For sure you get four equations for four unknowns. At least this is, it looks like it's a good situation and it is uh, typically. There may be a unique solution, there may be many solutions either. Huh? Okay, and you will do this as an exercise. What do you think will be the result? The result will be, oh no, I just don't tell you. You will see it when you do the exercise. No? Okay, now what will we do now here? Um, we will actually first, we will omit these, this part. No? Because we have already solved for these two values. We know already P1 and P2. So the only unknowns we have left are P3 and P4. So we can do the optimization. You see, here we have some degree of freedom. We do the optimization on P3 and P4 only. So we will now maximize the entropy, which is this function, under the constraint, given this constraint. Huh? Now, and how does this work? Um, the, um, such constraint optimizations problems can be solved using the, the, the Lagrange formalism. Huh? And how does this work? Um, what we have to do is First, we have to write our constraint as an equation equals zero. So now let's go back to slides. This is our constraint. 
We just bring this 1 minus alpha on the left hand side and we get this, uh, this equation. This is our constraint. It always has to be in the form something equals zero. This is our constraint and then we set up the Lagrange function which is the function we want to maximize plus such a Lagrange parameter lambda times our constraint. You see this is the constraint, the left hand side of the constraint. That's what we do all the time. So it's if we would omit this part here, we would just have the entropy and we would find a global maximum of the entropy. But now since we have to do a constraint optimization, we add all the constraints. There may be more than one constraint. Huh? If there is one constraint, we just add the constraint with an additional unknown parameter lambda. So what we, what we uh, do here is, you see, uh, initially we had two unknowns, P3 and P4. Huh? Now since we add this constraint here, we get an, an additional unknown lambda. So now we have three unknowns. Okay? And what we do, what we do next is the same as we, we, uh, we do with, without a constraint, we just compute the partial derivatives of our Lagrange function with respect to our unknowns, P3 and P4. So the Lagrange function uh, derivative with respect to P3 is, yeah, we have to derive this term here because this term gives zero derivative with respect to P3. Yeah? Let's look at this term. Uh, here we get a lambda and the rest is zero. Yeah? So we get from this, um, no, let me see, yeah. So this is zero and this gives the lambda. So what we have from these two terms is just the lambda. Now the derivative of this with respect to P3 is so we use the product rule, derivative of the first uh, factor times the second factor and you see this gives us a minus ln P3. Now we have to add the first factor times the derivative of the second which is P3 times 1 over P3. So P3 cancels out and we get a 1 and with this minus we have the minus 1. Okay, so this is what we get as an equation and if we do the same thing with respect to P4 and you see this is symmetric P3 and P4 here and here, so we just replace the P3 and get the P4 and we have this equation. Okay. And now we have two equations for three unknowns which is not good, so we have an underdetermined system again, but we have forgotten uh, our normalization condition. And the normalization condition here comes from P3 plus P4 is 1 minus alpha. This is actually the knowledge we already have about P3 and P4. And of course we have to add uh, this equation or you could say I mean, this is our constraint. This constraint gives us one equation. So we have already one equation which is our constraint. And we get these two uh, equations, so we have three equations for three unknowns. Okay. Now how can we solve this here? I mean, this is a system with three equations for three unknowns and there is a straightforward way to solve such systems. Or not. What, did you, what, what do you know about such systems? How do you solve them? <coughs> now in mathematics we just finished with linear algebra. So you know everything about linear algebra. Huh? 
So you know how to solve a linear system with three unknowns and three equations. So you just do elimination. Is that the way to proceed here? No. Why, why is it not so easy to do elimination here? Because this is not a linear system. And why? Because of the ln P3. I mean, P3 does not appear linearly. So this is not a linear system. This is a non-linear system with three equations for three unknowns. And here, mathematics may become really ugly. Huh? So there is no standard procedure for solving nonlinear systems of equations. This may become really ugly. But here we are happy. It's easy to solve this. I mean, look at these two equations. If we subtract the, the, the second from the first equation, then we get um, ln p3 is equal to ln p4. This, one, this minus 1 plus lambda cancels out. Okay, so now what can we conclude from this equation? P3 is equal to P4. P3 is equal to P4. Would you agree with this? I mean, it is okay, it's true. This is the only solution of this equation. But, uh, it's only true because we, ha we here have a very special function as the ln. Suppose you have the sine of x is equal to the sine of y. Here we would have infinitely many solutions. Here we have a unique solution. Why? What's the reason why we here can conclude P3 is equal to P4? What's the reason? It must be a property of the logarithm. It's because the logarithm function is strictly monotonic. Huh? That's why we can immediately conclude P3 is equal to P4. And now we are finished. Because, why are we finished? Set P4 equal to P3, and then we, can, we see 2 times P3 is equal to 1 minus alpha. So that means P3 is equal to 1 minus alpha. And since we know P3 is equal to P4, we know P4 also is, oh sorry, 1 minus alpha divided by 2. That's the solution. Yeah, and uh, I mean, yeah, that's what, we, that's what we get here as the solution. Yeah. We solved our system, our underdetermined system, by applying the maximum entropy principle. Are there any questions about this procedure? I mean, this is really important because that now gives us a means of solving any probabilistic problem no matter how, how much knowledge we have. 
If we have zero knowledge, so we know nothing, what will we do then? Excuse me? Um, yes, yes. I mean, that's true. I mean, I already told you, we can then conclude they all have to be equal. But suppose we wouldn't know this. How would we compute the solution? He would ma we would maximize the entropy with no constraints. We would just maximize the entropy of our uh, n variables, in, in this case four variables, and we would get a uniform distribution as a solution. Uh? Oh, now I, I, I gave you the answer, uh, the, the result for your uh, uh, exercise. But uh, still, you now have to prove that it's a, that it's a uniform uh, distribution. Yeah, so if you know nothing, you just maximize the entropy. If you know anything, you maximize the entropy and add all your constraints as constraints for the Lagrangian method. Oh, yes, uh, so how does the Lagrangian method work if you have two constraints? Who remembers this? And then we use two Lagrange parameters. So then we write lambda 1 times the first constraint plus lambda 2 times the second constraint and so on. And you see, for each constraint we get an, an additional uh, Lagrange parameter. So the number of unknowns is uh, it's, or let's say the, the, the number of new unknowns, the number of the lambdas is equal to the number of constraints. For each constraint we get an extra lambda. Uh, and this is okay because each constraint gives us an additional equation. So at the end we always have a square system. <coughs> so the number of unknowns is equal to the number of equations. And, uh, yeah. Okay, so now we can continue with our example. Um, we now can compute P of B. I mean, look, that's how, uh, how we started. We wanted to know what is P of B if we know these two guys, P of A equal to alpha, P of B given A equal to beta, we wanted to know what is P of B. Now we can compute P of B. P of B is this sum which is P1 plus P3 and we know, what do we know about P1? is alpha times beta and P3 is 1 minus alpha uh, divided by 2 and this gives this expression. Um, yeah. And yes, and if we substitute for alpha and beta, what we know about alpha and beta, where uh, alpha is p of a and b, um, oh, and alpha times beta is p1. Alpha times beta is p of a and b. No, is that true? Yeah, alpha is P of A. Yes, we get P of A here for alpha and for beta we get P of B given A. So we have this formula for P of B. And you see, we can now compute B, P of B. We just have a formula. So now we could write here P of B is equal to this formula. And now we know how to compute P of B out of these two values. And here we have a diagram. Um, the horizontal axis shows P of A. The vertical axis P of B. And yeah, I mean, uh, we, we would actually need a third axis like P of B given A. 
um, and now to, to show it on two dimensions, we just uh, get a set of uh, solution curves for these different values of P of B given A. So now let's start with P of B given A equal 1. So what does that mean? That means um, if we know A, then the probability um, for B, so if A is true, then B is true. Uh, this is the strong logical implication. Uh, now, we get this curve here. This extreme point is, this is the point P, uh, A is true. So if A is true, then B is true. So if A is equal 1, then we get uh, B equal 1 here. Uh, now, um, let's take P of A equals 0. If P of, if so we know this, P of B given A is equal to 1. Now if P of A is 0, that means A is false, then we know nothing about B. We, know per we have perfect knowledge about B if we have perfect knowledge about A. But if we have no knowledge about A, we know nothing about B. And know nothing about B means P of B equal 0.5. That's what we have here at that point. Huh? And you, as you can see, all our lines, they match here at this point. That means it, it actually doesn't matter which value P of B given A has. As soon as P of A is equal to 0, we know nothing about P of B, so we get 0.5. And now you can look at other values of P of B given A. For example, P of B given A is equal to zero means, yeah, this tells us if, if we know A perfectly, then, um, so if A is true, then B is false. And that's what we see here. If A is true, if we have one on this axis, we get zero for P of B. And what you also can see, what's nice here, we have a linear, uh, a linear function in between these extreme values. You see, this is linear. This function is linear in P of A. Yeah. Oh, uh, we should why don't we compute the value P of B for this setting, 0.9 and 0.75? What do we get? Um, P of B is equal to P of A. What is P of A? 0.9 times P of B given A, 0.75 minus 0.5 times, no, plus one half. And this is 0.25 times 0.9 is 0.225 plus 0.5 is equal to point. 7 to 5. Okay, yeah, let's look. At, at the beginning we have seen P of B has to be somewhere in this interval. And um, now this is the, the difference between this and that is point zero five yeah so you see the solution is closer to this value than uh, than to one so it's 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 not in the middle it's somewhere yeah 
Okay. Um, yes, now let's look at this theorem. Because this theorem, um, I mean, it's a really deep theorem, and proving this theorem is not easy at all. Huh? And so we just state the result here. Let there be a consistent set of linear probabilistic equations. I mean, what does consistent mean? Consistent means there is no cr uh, contradiction. An inconsistent set of equations, for example, would be um, P of A is equal to point 0.2 and P of A is equal to point 0.9. I mean, this cannot be uh, that the probability for A is 20% and at the same time 90%. This is an inconsistent set of equations. Huh? Or, uh, yeah. Um, so we need, of course, to have a consistent set because if the set of equations is inconsistent, then there is no solution. Huh? Uh, then there exists a unique maximum for the entropy function. This is very important. A unique maximum of the entropy. Uh, so that means finally we get a unique solution. And this is not obvious at all. I mean, if we have a consistent set of n linear equations for n unknowns, then we get a unique solution all the time. But as soon as our equations are nonlinear, there may be, I mean, anything may happen. No solution, one solution, five solutions, 17 solutions, infinitely many solutions, everything is possible. Um, okay, but if we do the maximum, uh, the, if we maximize the entropy function, we get a unique maximum with the given equations as constraints. And the max n distribution um, yeah, um, yeah, okay, I mean, this is just an explanation of, of uh, the entropy function. Um, so the solution we get has minimum information contents given these constraints. Okay, oh yes, and I forgot something. Let me look whether this is correct in the book because this is a little bit inexact. Um, where are we in the book? Ah, yeah, okay. Oh, yeah, 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 it's it's correct. I just didn't read it. Let there be a consistent set of linear probabilistic equations. Huh? So the probabilistic equations that we have at the beginning, look, these equations here, they have to be linear equations. That's important. Otherwise, this theorem is not no longer true. So these equations have to be linear. So now, um, maybe it's confusing. So now here we assume we need a set of linear probabilistic equations. And then I said, okay, the whole thing is nonlinear and everything may, be, may happen. How can we understand this? A linear set of equations, but finally we have to solve nonlinear equations. Why? Because we do not solve these equations directly. We do maximum entropy, we compute the partial derivatives, and these equations may be nonlinear. You have seen it. We had nonlinear equations. But anyway, if these equations are linear, then our nonlinear max end equations will have a unique solution. That can be proven. Yeah. Okay, yeah, and, and two remarks. So this first remark, there is no other distribution that satisfies the constraints 
um, and having maximum entropy. There is only this one distribution which we get from our max informalism. Now, suppose there, there is somebody who tells you, no, you have to do something else. We don't do maximum entropy, we have a different calculus. And now, to, to this guy you can answer, okay, either your calculus has the same solution as maxent, and then it's okay, or it is incorrect. Because it can be proven that um, the max end calculus um, is optimal. Because, why is it optimal? Because the amount of information that max end adds is minimal. There is no other formalism that adds less knowledge um, to our distribution. And therefore, any calculus that gives you a different answer is not optimal. It may be okay for certain applications, but max end is optimal. There is no better uh, procedure than using max end. Okay, yeah, yeah. And now let's go back to our example. Um, what we found out at the end was P4 is equal to P3. Um, and let's look here at our equations. We could have seen it already here. Why? Because P3 and P4, where do they occur? They occur here and here. And what we can see here in these two equations where they occur, uh, oh actually I mean this, is, this equation is derived from this one. This is the only equation where we have P3 and P4. And here these two variables occur symmetrically. What happens if we swap these two? If we exchange P3 and P4, nothing changes. The equation does not change. And if this is the case, we call such variables indifferent. In this linear system, P3 and P4 are indifferent variables. Indifferent means if we exchange the two variables, nothing changes. No? And if this is the case, then we already know at this point that they have to have the same value. So we, we actually, in this example, we didn't, we wouldn't uh, need the max end formalism. We just would see here, they are indifferent and then they get the same value and that's it. And I mean, we, we are finished then. If we then uh, conclude P3 is equal to P4, then we can enter this here and we get the result we had over there. Yeah, and I mean, what I, this, this principle of indifference, this can be concluded from max end. So it can be proven from our max end theorem that if a set of variables, P1, PI1 up to PIK, this may be some variables, if such a set is indifferent, then the maximum of the entropy under the given constraints is at the point where all these variables are equal. So this may, uh, you see this, this is even more general, it's not, it doesn't talk about two variables, it talks about a set of k variables. Yeah? And what does it mean um, for k variables to be um, indifferent, that's what we have here. If an ar arbitrary exchange of two or more variables in the Lagrange equations results in equivalent equations, 
these variables are called indifferent. Okay, so it's a little bit different. I mean, this definition talks about the Lagrange equations, not about these original linear equations. But I, I mean, if our variables in these original equations are indifferent, then they will be in the Lagrange equations too. Okay, yeah. Oh, here we have this example, your, your exercise. So, if we do maximum entropy without any explicit constraints, so that's the case where we know nothing, then the only equation is this normalization constraint. Um, and if we then apply max end, this will be the solution, the uniform distribution. Okay, oh yes, um, let's go back. I, I just skipped this picture here, this one. This is pretty important to see this picture. What we have here is um, a graph of the max n function for two variables. Uh, uh, sorry, not the max n. Uh, a graph of the entropy for the case of two variables. Two variables, let's call them P3 and P4. And now this, this function is, uh, what is it? Um, it's minus ln p3, uh, yeah, minus p3 times ln p3 plus p4 times ln p4. And this is the graph of, of this function. What you can see is the contour lines here, and here somewhere in the middle, um, we get a maximum. So our entropy function is a convex function with one unique isolated maximum here. And now look at the case. We have two variables, P3 and P4, and so we, if we only have these two variables, then our normalization condition is P3 plus P4 is equal to 1, because they have to add up to 1. Okay, this is the normalization condition. If we solve it for P4, then this is P4 is equal to 1 minus P3, which is this line here. This is our constraint. Huh? And now we do, we, we maximize the entropy given this constraint here. And this means, um, I mean, yeah, for all those who have been out in, uh, in the uh, mountains over the weekend and been hiking with this very nice, beautiful autumn weather, maybe you took your topographic map and on this topographic map there are hills like this guy here and suppose this is your hiking trail. What would that mean? That means, okay, you start down here somewhere in some valley and you hike up uphill all the time and this will be the highest point of your trail and here it goes down again. Huh? This is all about uh, uh, optimization with constraints. So your constraint is a line. No? And now in this picture you can see why our theorem tells us if the constraints are linear then you get a unique maximum. You can see this is a linear constraint and take any other linear constraint like this, like that, like that you always get a unique maximum, one unique maximum. Can you imagine a nonlinear constraint that gives you more than one 
maxima. Somebody have an idea? So I, I will draw one in here. Suppose our constraint looks like this. Then, what do we get? Suppose this is your hiking trail. This is uh, a minimum here. And it goes uphill all the time up here. There is a maximum. Here we get a minimum again, maximum again, and minimum. So as soon as your constraints are nonlinear, you get, you can get multiple maxima of the entropy and the solution is no longer unique. Huh? I mean then uh, it can be solved too, huh? but it's not so easy. What would we do here? We would try to find these maxima, we get two maxima, and then among these two maxima we would compare these two guys and we would see, okay, the value here is bigger than this one and then of course we would select the bigger maximum. Okay, yeah, it's time to stop now. Thank you.